Praise the Lord. Welcome to Abiding in His Word through R.M. Hamer Ministries. We're so glad that you're tuned in with us on this wonderful Thursday evening. We're excited about bringing you the Word of God that's going to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. Amen? Yes, feed your faith concerning God's will to heal all that are sick, that you may know that you know that you know it is the Father's good pleasure to give you everything that pertains to the kingdom. Amen. And you're in the kingdom. Glory be to God. And praise God, all that's in the kingdom has been provided for you as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. Now, we're not speaking to the world. The world has nothing to do with the benefits that we have. You know, the Bible talks about in the book of Psalms uh, 103, it said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all of thy iniquities. Now listen to this. And healeth thee of all thy diseases. Oh yes, who satisfies thy mouth with good things and renews thy youth as the eagle. Praise God. These are the benefits that God wants us not to forget that are provided through us through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm telling you, if there's anything that the devil will fight against you coming into the knowledge of, and that is the knowledge of the benefits that God has provided for you through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, healing is already yours. Praise God. It's just a matter of us understanding how to receive it. Praise God. It's up in the storehouse of heaven. Got your name on it. Amen. Well, that's what we're endeavoring to do. I know I'm it with and many other men and women of God are endeavoring to preach and teach the truth to you so that you can come into the knowledge of that which belongs to you. It's your, in, it's your redemptive right. It's your inherited right. Amen. Because you're an heir of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Well, you can tell I'm excited right out from the gate. Amen. Now, listen, I want to advise you to go grab your iPhones, your tablets, your laptops laptops, your paper of leatherback Bible, or even your desktop, praise God. Get sit down at it, praise God, and open up the Bible as you're watching this program and you're learning the truth that we're revealing to you through the Word of God, okay? In the meantime, while you're doing that, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get right into our lesson. Father, we come before the throne of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, we thank you for the God that hears and answers the prayers of the righteous. For your eyes are over us and your ears are always open unto our prayers. Now, Father, I welcome you to manifest yourself by your Holy Spirit, confirming your word with signs and, fo- signs and wonders following, even in their very homes, as they hear and receive the engrafted word, which is able to restore their souls. Praise God. Thank you, Father, for doing it. I expect it to be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. Well, we're continuing our lessons almost to the end of it. Praise God. I'm not trying to rush it. I'm going to stay with it and then We'll go on to something else unless the Lord says something different because I'm his servant, praise God. I'm a labor together with him. But listen, I'm following after him who instructed me to teach this particular lesson that I've been doing over a period of time. God's will is to heal all that are sick. It is his will. Now, we talked about lame uh, last week. We talked about that God's main ways, and not only the last Monday, but last week, we talked about God's main way for healing the sick is through believing and acting on his word. We showed you scriptures out of Psalms 107, 20, John the 8th chapter, uh, verses 31 to 32, Romans 1, 16, where we follow upon Paul speaking and writing to the Roman believer, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, listen, that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. The Greek simply means those who were non-Jewish people. They were not of the tribe of the Jewish tribe of Abraham, you know, Isaac and Jacob, praise God. And so God wants you, if you believe, his will is for if you believe, the power of God has salvation, uh, deliverance, preservation, and safety for you if you believe it and act upon it. And then we talked about Acts the 14 chapter with Paul uh, who spoke to someone and, and this person heard and believed and, and they got healed. 
And so we also talked about some other things. We talked about personal prayer for healing, how you can pray for yourself and receive your healing for yourself because it is God's will for every believer to learn to stand upon their own two faith feet. Amen. Praise God. I had to practice on that because that's a little tongue tire right there. But it is God's will for you to get to the place of spiritual maturity that you can come to the throne of God without asking anybody else, but upon your own two faith feet, your own faith that you have fed and then strengthened by exercise, you can go to God and receive whatever you need at any time. You see, this way, this, this means of healing by your own personal prayer, the wonderful benefits about it is that it can be done over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You see, we're in this world, and because we're in this world, we're on enemy territory. And the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's always looking for somebody so that then their guard is not down. Because, you know, the scriptures in Peter says, uh, uh, it says, um, in the scripture of first Peter, it says, um, um, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary as a roaring lion goeth about uh, uh, walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he's always on the hunt. And that's why the Bible tells us to be sober minded, clear minded and to be vigilant. That means to be watchful. Amen. To be on guard. So when something comes against you, then you automatically release your authority of faith and said, no, devil, you take that off my body. No, devil, you're not putting that on my body. The Bible says, submit yourself unto God, which is submit yourself unto his word. And then he says, resist the devil. And the Bible says he will flee from you. Glory be to God. But see, if you don't do that, it won't work for you. Amen. If you sit around waiting for your change to come, then the devil's going to be beating you upside the head on one side, all down on the top and down the other, and then start over on the other side and come back to the other side. Amen. You don't want that rascal to do that because he's defeated. Jesus took away from him all authority. He took away from him the keys of death and hell. Now, he's a great deceiver, and he's the God of this world, which means he's the God of the sinner. And so he can go and attack the sinner anytime he wants to. But what he really wants, he wants to attack the children of God because he hates the children of God because he hates God. Amen. And you are a child of God. And that's why God gave us the weapons of our warfare. Praise God, which are not carnal. Amen. They're mighty through God. And God is in you. Amen. Yes. Your body is the temple of, of the spirit of God, uh, temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Oh, man, I'm just getting excited just talking about this, man. <laughs> I'm so thankful I've learned this truth. Oh, yes, and I've learned to apply it in my life. When I get attacked in my body, first thing I do is I apply the word to it because I've come into the knowledge of the truth, and the truth has made me free. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of COVID. I'm not afraid of any sickness or disease. I don't have to be. Because God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. He gave me a spirit of power, a love, and a sound mind. Yes, greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world. He's given me the means whereby I can put on the whole arm of God. And that after having done all, I can stand against all of the wiles of the devil. Yes, the whole arm of God. Not just part of it. You got to put the whole armor on. But one thing you got to do is come into the knowledge what the armor is. And that's where it comes through the teaching and the preaching of the word. And that's why God has set people like me in the church to teach the word. So we found out that you can receive your healing on your own two faith feet. We call the prayer of faith, Mark eleven twenty four, And we looked at some other scriptures. We also found out that we can also receive our healing through the prayer of agreement where we can get somebody to agree with us in prayer. Amen. If two of you shall agree on earth, Matthew 18, 19, if again, I, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by, our, by my father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, for two or three are gathered in my name, excuse me, Jesus says, I'm in the midst of that prayer, that prayer that's in line with the will of my father, that is for you to be healed, for you to be delivered. And it can be used for any other thing also. And this is a great prayer for a husband and wife to always pray together because they walk in unity in one another. And the husband's loving the wife as Christ loves the church. Giving honor unto her as unto the weaker vessel. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Husbands, you got a responsibility. Don't be like Adam. Neglect your responsibility. And let the devil get in there and stuff, you know, and mess with her and what have you. All right? Praise the Lord. Of course, the wife has some responsibility too. All right. So I want to talk now tonight about ways to minister healing to the sick because the two I gave you last uh, Monday and uh, I think probably Thursday, the week before then, and about the ways that you can receive healing uh, on your own two faith feet. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Or get someone who to get in the prayer of agreement with you. One or two or three or what have you. So we're going to talk about ways to minister healing to the sick. Now we want to talk about Mark the 16th chapter is a means by which God is provided in his word for us to receive healing for our physical bodies. Now this particular scripture I'm going to share with you is not only for the Christian but it's also for the sinner. It is a dinner bell for the people who are lost. This verse of scripture, you use this verse of scripture when you go out into the by roads and the highways and the hedges and compelling them to come to the, f to the house of God, to come unto God. Amen. You're going out witnessing so that you can win the loss. Praise God. And so one of the things about it is Satan, man, he hates his children. He's the God of this world. He's the God of the Satan. And man, I'm telling you, he's so angry and so he's crazy. He's a lunatic. He'll put, he's, put, he's, put, he's putting and has put sickness upon them, afflicted them in all kind of ways, blinded them from the truth and causing them to do all kind of nonsensical things that just, just to destroy them, to kill them. Amen. And they don't know it. They don't know it. They don't know about the goodness of God. So when you go out and witness, then you can use the word of God, which is the power of God unto deliverance, preservation and safety, deliverance from them, from the deliverance from the powers of darkness so that they can receive the goodness of God in their lives and the lives of the loved one and be healed. And I'm going to share a testimony about that. But let's go to Mark the 16th chapter first. OK, ah, oh my God, my God, my God, I just get excited. I just love the word of God. I love his word. I, I'm just, you know, praise the Lord. I just love it. I don't know about you, but I love it. In the Mark, the 16th chapter, we want to start at verse number 17. Verse number 17. And while you are finding that, if you already found it, give me a moment to take a little sip of this water. And so starting verse number 17, it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Now they, I want to use the word, the crucible, the crux of this particular uh, verse or sentence. It says, and these signs shall positively, absolutely, absolutely unequivocally follow them. Them who? Them that believe. So this answers the question why we don't see a lot of the signs that Jesus said in Mark the 16th chapter that would follow in manifestations in our local churches or in our homes or out there on the streets when you witness into the center. And it's not because God has gotten old and senile and his hand has shortened, you know, he's not shriveled up because of his age, you know. He's the age of eternity, <laughs> praise God. I'm just being facetious, you know, God is not old. He's, you know, he, there's no such thing as old. There's no time with him. He dwells in eternity. But my point is, is the reason why these signs are not manifested is because people don't believe. And believing is simply accepting the word of God is true and real. Did you hear that? I was just doing a selah, you know, pause and think about that. The only reason that these signs don't manifest is because people don't believe. And we know they don't believe because they don't do it. You can't say you believe something and you don't do it. It's kind of like the man that came into the uh, church setting one time and a church service. It's a little, you know, what they call it, the parable story of a man that came into a service and the church was going on and the preacher was preaching and all of a sudden he walked down the middle of the aisle and the preacher just kept preaching and kind of looking at him and stuff and finally he got into almost to the, to, to the, to, to the um, 
a platform and all of a sudden he just fell down on the ground, on the floor. The man was emancipated, you know, he was thin, you know, looking disheveled. And finally the pastor looked down there and, and ran down there to see what was going on. And finally he said, is there a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? And just so happened there was a doctor, doctor in the, the church that attended the church. And the doctor came and began to examine the man. And, you know, and for a minute there, you know, and turned him over and did what he doctors do. And finally the doctor whispered to the pastor. And then the pastor said to the congregation, say, uh, um, uh, brothers and sisters, I want to inform you that this man who just came into the church and down here to the front, to the uh, to the podium, uh, hi, this man has f has 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 fainted because he's at the point of starvation. And if he doesn't get any food in the next 25 minutes, he's going to die. I need somebody to go out and get some food and bring it back here right away. And so there were certain people jumped up. Some of them were fighting one another, you know, just, you know, arguing who's going to go get it. And finally, he got a person went and got it, and they rushed and got the food, and they came back. And by this time, it must have been around about 10, 15, 20 minutes when they came back with the food. So now the man has five minutes so that he can eat this food and not die. So they put, they propped the man up in a chair, put a table in front of him, put down in front of him on the table all these delicious food that would provide substance for his body. And they told the man, said, Mr., Mr., listen, you're on the brink of starvation and if you don't eat this food right now you're going to die do you believe that and the man looks up at the pastor with such a disdain in his eyes and says do you think i'm some kind of fool yes i believe that if i eat that food i won't die i'm not no dummy i have some education i know if i eat this food i would die and so the pastor says well if you eat this food now then, you know, you eat it now, you're not going to die. He said, why you, I told you that I believe. Now, by this time, we have about four minutes, and we have about, you know, 30 or uh, uh, 57 seconds left. And the man is sitting there just arguing and just boastfully, proudly saying, I know, I believe that if I eat this food, and then around about, you know, four minutes and 59 seconds, all of a sudden, the man says, I absolutely believe. Yeah, and he fell out and he died. Now, I want to ask you a question with your scholarly, intellectual, smart self. Why did the man die? The food was right before him. And he, he believed. He believed with all of his heart. I mean, if you put a fire him before him, put him before a firing squad, he would have just let them shoot because he says, I believe. But why did he die? Even though he believed. Well, I can't hear you what your answer is. But just in case you didn't give the right answer, I'm going to tell you why the man died. The man died because he didn't act upon what he believed. And you know, there's the same way in the church with people. When this verse of scripture was inspired some years ago to be written in the Bible and, and believers begin to be going born again and maybe you got born again and you read this verse of scripture, maybe you're a preacher, maybe you're an apostle, a doctor, apostle, whatever, so-and-so, and you read this scripture. But you never had any signs, wonders, no signs that Jesus talked about would follow you because you believed. What's the reason why? Because you never acted upon it. You know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So you can believe and not act upon that, and it won't do you any good. Any, any good. Any good. <laughs> you got to act upon it. And you have to act upon it because you believe it. That's the way the kingdom of God operates. When you received your salvation, you received your salvation because you believe the gospel unto salvation. And when you believe it, you act upon it. You act upon receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You confessed, prayed the prayer of salvation, came down to the altar. Me, I was in an apartment building in Colleen, Texas in July 1976. And I cried out in that apartment building. I said, oh, my God, help me, please. I turned to God. I was in a place where I needed some help. And I never forget. Something happened on the inside of me. Oh, glory be to God forevermore. <sighs> I can tell you some more about that. 
But I got born again, didn't understand what it meant till I called my auntie over in, in Los Angeles, California. I was in Clean, Texas, at Fort Hood, Texas, in the military, United States Army. And she told me, follow that. You got a little man on the inside of you, just follow him. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And I did. So long story short. But I believed. I believed what I heard, reading tracts, being witnesses to, witness to, attending churches and heard them uh, uh, present the plan of salvation. And I came to the point where I acted upon it. I acted upon what I believed. Romans 10, 13, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what I did. I acted upon what I believed. Mark, the 16th chapter, verse number 17 says, Jesus said it, and these signs shall absolutely, positively, unequivocally shall follow them that believe. Then he tells you what's going to follow. He says, in my name, in my name, now that's a qualifier right there. Because when you do these things, you have to do them in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that name, Jesus Christ, is a name that's above every name. The Bible tells us that when Jesus, because of his obedience unto God the Father, to come down from heaven and take on the form of a flesh and to uh, become like man and become obedient unto every bit of God's will for him that was written in the Old Testament law, he fulfilled every bit of it. He didn't fail in one jot, jot or one tittle. <laughs> Amen, whatever that means. And then he <coughs> was obedient to go to, the, to go to the cross. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was praying and he knew that his hour had come and he was there on his knees praying and he told the Peter, Peter and James and uh, John, I think three of them, and told them, you know, to to wait here while he go yonder and pray. And he fell on his knees. And the Bible says he prayed so earnestly that sweat came out of him like great drops of blood. And he says, Abba, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And God's will was him to be the sacrificial lamb for the sins of all the mankind. From that time of Adam to the present time right now. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That means he was made sin who knew no sin on the cross. That's why he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cried that out because he was separated from the Father. He became sin. Like you and I were born into this world as sinners. That's why we needed to become born again. And you know the rest of the story. I don't have to go through that. So this same Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. So that name was given to him when he obeyed God. After he had descended down into the place of Sheol, the place of torment, for three days and three nights to pay the penalty for Adam and Eve's transgression. And then on the third day, he was raised from the dead. That's why the scripture says in the book of Romans, in the uh, sixth chapter, I believe it is, or sixth chapter, it says, uh, uh, God committed his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. Paul was saying that after it happened. He already did it. He died for the ungodly. So when he died and he rose again, the Bible says he was highly exalted. He was highly exalted, highly raised up when he came out of the place of show after he paid the penalty. And God gave him a name that is above every name. That at that name, what name? The name of Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Oh, my, 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 my. So that's why you have to use that name. It's above every name. Demons tremble at that name. Sickness flee at that name. Demon possession is gone from that individual in that name. So you got to remember to use the name. The key is the name. It's not your power. It's not your ability. It's not your holiness. It ain't your title either. It has nothing to do with you and me. It's the name of Jesus. It has to do with you and I believing. 
because he said these signs should follow them that believe. If you don't believe, ain't nothing, nothing. You understand nothing? Ain't nothing going to happen. You have to believe it. You have to accept God's word as true. And the unfortunate thing is because Christians don't believe. Um, we'll bypass that. So, he said, these signs shall follow my belief in my name. The name, what? The name of Jesus Christ. He says, in my name they shall cast out devils. That's talking about you. I mean, you may have just gotten born again the last 30 minutes ago, man, last few seconds ago. You just got born again. You have a right to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. This authority, delegated authority, wasn't given to someone who's been, you know, who's got the title of apostle, <laughs> you know, or whatever, or got a doctor degree behind their name, and, you know, and their doctor so-and-so, you know, of divinity and blah, 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 and et cetera. <laughs> oh, these titles. Now, listen, if you believe it and you act upon it, it'll happen for you. Here's my testimony. I'm, let me read the rest of this, and I'll give you my testimony. And it says, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. That is, they'll speak in tongues uh, by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They shall take up serpents. That is, if you pick up and get bit by a serpent, scorpion, what have you, accidentally, then there's nothing going to happen to you because you, you're doing the work of God. Paul was in the out of... Um, in this island, I forget the name of this island, but he was on an island because he was being taken to Rome as a prisoner to make his plea before Caesar. And he was putting wood into a fire because it was cold. And a scorpion jumped out and on his hand and bit him. Paul looked at it, shook it off, and he kept doing it. And the natives, when they looked and saw it happen, they, they felt for sure he was going to drop dead. He should have, but he didn't because these signs followed him because he believed. He was bitten by a serpent. He was bitten by a scorpion. But he didn't die. That'll happen for you if you're out in the wilderness somewhere. Just don't pick up no sta snakes like you got some blessed darling hearts and stupid head Christians that are going out doing it and, you know, to prove that they believe this. And you, they tempting God. Some of them had died. <laughs> he said, then they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, and if you consume something deadly and you don't know it's deadly, and you drank it, and there was a testimony of, of, of these preachers. They were in a certain city down in Texas somewhere, and this person that was in the hotel where they were at, you know, they knew they were the, they were some Bible believing, you know, Pentecostal believers and stuff, and they thought they put a uh, play a prank on them. Actually, it was a wicked deed, and they put some poison in the water because they had basins of waters in the hotel, and somebody did that because they believed these signs, and the men were drinking the water. And then they investigated and tested the water and found that the water was poison. And finally, these preachers turned around because they turned deathly sick. And they started praying for one another in the name of Jesus, laying hands. And guess what? Guess what? God healed every one of them. None of them died. That's the true story. Well, I don't believe all that. Okay. Well, you just sit there to the side. If you don't believe, that's okay. It'll never work for you. He said, they shall take up serpents and they drink any deadly thing and shall not hurt them. And then he says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So here's a means to lay hands on sick folk and they shall recover. It's another means by which God can bring healing to the body of an individual. These signs shall follow them that believe. In the name of Jesus, these are hands. I have hands. I have done it countless times and people have been healed. Not because I was someone special, simply because I believe. I guess that makes me special because I'm a believer. Are you a believer? That makes you special also. Back in uh, Petersburg, uh, Hopewell, Virginia, somewhere back in the 1970s, I was in the United States military. I was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia, there in Hopewell, and I began to go around. I was a new Christian, hadn't been born again too long, had gotten born again in the, in the, in the apartment building in Killeen, Texas, was shipped overseas to Korea, to uh, do a military stay there, 60 miles from the DMZ, that's the border between South Korea and North Korea, which is technically they're still at war. And uh, <coughs> as I was there, I was going out. No, no, excuse me. I went back to Hopewell, Virginia. That's why I went back to Hopewell, Virginia after leaving uh, South Korea. And I was stationed there at Fort Lee. 
And so I was going around and I was just, you know, trying to find believers that I can fellowship with because, you know, I just gotten there and I went to the church and it was called St. Luke Church of God Live On. St. Luke Apostolic Church of God Live On. That was the name of the church. And, B- and Bishop Cross, a wonderful pastor, wonderful man of God, you know, and he befriended me and stuff. And, you know, and I would go out sometimes onto his farm where he had all these pigs and stuff, you know, and I got a good experience about farm life, <laughs> praise God. And uh, so I was in his church and stuff, and I was just, man, I was always, when I got born again, I was always witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Through my witnessing, countless men got born again. I had a Korean soldier on the, tr- pl- on the plane flying over to Korea for the first time well, as I was reading my little Bible and stuff and asked me, how do, you bel- how do you know there's a God? And I'm just a new born again Christian and all I can think about is about the creation and I begin to witness to him. He wrote me a letter, b- letter about seven months later when he got to his base. He knew I was going go to go to pe- Camp Page, Chunchan, and to let me know that because of what I said to him, he became a Christian. Praise God. Amen. I preached the gospel. That's all I did. Nothing special about me. And so, <coughs> oh man, I could tell you some stories about Korea. So here in this place, here in Hopewell, Virginia, I went out witnessing. I went out witnessing, and I, I believe I was by myself. I was just witnessing by myself. I knocked on the door, and this little young lady come to the door, and I said, hi, my name is so-and-so, and praise God, you know, and we are, I mean, I'm over here at uh, St. Luke Apostolic Church of God, and Christ, uh, uh, Church of God, live on, and uh, we're just witnessing and going around praying for people. If you need prayer, anybody need prayer? And that was my, my, my answer. Do anybody need prayer? Based upon Mark, the 16th chapter. She said, yes, yes, come in. My, my, my little baby, she's sick, she's sick. Yes, come in. Can you pray for her? I said, sure, I can come and pray for her. So I walked in the door, went inside of there. She brought the baby down. She said, mama, come here, bring the baby. Mama, come here, bring the baby. Come here, quick, quick. So the mama came downstairs and had the baby, and the baby was just crying. Wah, wah. I know I don't sound like a baby, but that's where it sounded. And so they brought the baby to me and stuff, and I went over to the baby and stuff and marked the 16th chapter because I believed I had nothing special about me. I was just a Christian. Didn't even know I was called to the gospel. And I laid my hands on the baby. When I laid my hands on the baby, all of a sudden I prayed in the name of Jesus. I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And I felt in her head as I, she began to grow. She had a high fever. I can feel the heat. And she begin, the fever began to le- leave, and the baby stopped crying. Do you want to know the effects of that that happened to this baby and this young girl who wasn't even born again and her mama wasn't born again? They all got so excited, and I told them, I said, yes, Jesus healed your baby, and the same Jesus that healed you wants to heal your spirit. He wants you to become born again, and I witnessed to them, and she, before I witnessed to them, I said, do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She said, yes, yes, yes. I said, okay, let's let pray the prayer. She said, hold on, hold on. Let me get my kids. Let me get my kids, and she called upstairs, and all these kids came downstairs, and I led the whole family to receive. Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Just simply because these signs follow them that believe, my brothers and sisters, and this baby got healed. Another testimony, same place. I moved from Hopewell to Petersburg, Virginia, which is just on the other side of the base. And I was with the um, now Kojic Church, Church of God in Christ, and I went with the pastor's wife, and we went out and some other teams to the projects to witness. I, I believe in witnessing. I believe in sharing the gospel. I do it to this day. And we were knocking on the doors. We knocked on one particular door. And as we knocked on the door, we heard a faint voice inside says, come in. And so we opened the door up and walked in. And as we walked in straight to the door, we looked over there toward the wall. And there on a hospital bed was an elderly lady she was laying on the bed they had took her from the hospital in the hospital bed directly back home and here she was laying on that bed had been there for a number of weeks or what have you i walked in with the pastor's wife and i said ma'am hi we're from such and such a church and this is the pastor's wife here and, and we're just going around praying for folks and stuff, you know, and, and, and we want to know, do you need prayer? Can we pray for you? She said, yes, yes. I said, okay, ma'am. And so we walked over there to her, and I said, okay, ma'am, uh, I want to I wanna pray for you. And I said, and Jesus is going to heal your body when I pray for you, and then he's going to heal your spirit. Now, I said heal your spirit because I didn't know that spirits don't get healed. They get born again. 
Because, you know, that's what you are. You're a spirit, right? You know that, right? You're a spirit, have a soul, live in a physical body. Well, you ain't been following the program. You got to go back and listen to some of the programs we have out there on YouTube. Okay? Now, I said, so we're going to pray for you. I said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay my hands up on you, and you're going to be healed. Are you ready? And I began to share some scriptures with her. She said, yes. So I said, okay, now, ma'am. And um, I, I laid my hands upon her. I said, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would heal this lady from her condition in her body in the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Then I stepped back, and I pointed to her. I said, now, ma'am, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Just as bold as that. I'm just a young Christian. I didn't know much. She started to get out of bed, and I noticed she didn't have any, she only had bed clothes on. So I turned my back. I said, wait a minute, ma'am, wait a minute. And I turned my back, and I said, sister so-and-so, uh, put, get a robe. Get a robe. Put a robe on her, you know, being a gentleman. And she put a robe on her. She got a robe on her? She said, yeah. I turned around. I said, now, ma'am, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. God is my witness. She walked. She got out of bed, got up and walked across the floor, walked back, walked back again, walked back, lifted her head up. She was just shouting, just rejoicing. And then all of a sudden, the door opened and her daughter came in the house. And she looked and she saw her mama walking around and she said, Mama, Mama, look at you. Look at you. She was so excited. She said, Mama, what happened? I said, Jesus healed your mama. Your Jesus healed your mama. And, and I said, the same, I said, the same Jesus that healed your mama is the same Jesus that wants to heal your spirit. And you can get born again. And I think I let the lady to receive salvation first. And then I ministered healing unto her. That's what I did. They're talking about the one that's in the stretcher bed. So I told her what Jesus had done. I said, Jesus healed your mama. I said, he's healed, he healed her and he's healed her spirit. And I said, the same Jesus that healed her spirit wants to heal your spirit. Do you want to, well, you want to receive Jesus too? She said, yes, yes. And so I led her to a prayer of salvation. And the woman got born wonderfully go born again. Wasn't that exciting? Oh, we were rejoicing. And then all of a sudden, a little while later, the, the daughter's daughter came in the door. And when she walked in, she saw her. She said, that's my daughter. That's my daughter. She's got this nervous problem. She got this nervous problem. Can you pray for her? I said, we sure can. So I began to minister to her. I led her to receive Jesus Christ, laid hands upon her, and God healed her. Oh, I'm telling we had a glorious time <laughs> in that apartment building. Oh, we were just shouting and rejoicing what God had done in the name of Jesus because we believe. And the following Sunday, and the pastor let me preach, and I preached the message. Can't remember what it was. The church, that following Sunday, the father, the husband came to church. Two other kids came to church. The mama came to church. And the daughter and the daughter's daughter came to church. Her husband got born again. And I think one of the kids got born again. Out of that one obedience of believing Mark the 16th chapter people got born again now what I'm telling you is not to add up to you know brag on myself it, it wasn't me anyway it was the name of Jesus the only thing I did was believe and act upon what I believe I got testimonies after testimonies I can share with you but my time is I just don't have enough time and sometimes people ain't got enough time to listen but I know it works because I've acted upon myself. And I, and, and I endeavor to act upon it, even in family situations. But, you know, sometimes when people don't receive you and stuff, you can't do anything. You just got to step back and, you know, let the dice fall where they are. It hurts your heart. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. It's another means where God provided so that people can heal, even Christians. I've walked into places, living in Denver, Colorado. Lady on the bed, went in there and laid hands on her and prayed for her, and she got healed. Another time where I was holding a healing service at a particular church at Pastor David Young's, you know, Church of God in Christ, and had a healing service. This young girl, this young lady, she had a car accident. The car accident was very bad, and she had her, her, her leg was broken, and they had to put a rod in her leg, and then her part of her heel of her foot had been served, had been cut off. And she came to the service, and... She had been reading scriptures and believing God, and I just had the altar call to pay, lay hands on the people that were, you know, needed healing. I don't care what it was. You needed healing. And she came down front and stuff, and I had to sit down, and I laid my hands up on her feet. Right before our eyes, we saw her leg grow out, and her heel, her heel was recreated. 
These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall lay hands on the sick. But you have to believe. You have to believe in Mark 11, 20, 24, what things will be desired when you pray. Believe that you receive them when you pray, and you shall have them. Matthews 18, 19. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. For Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, that name, glory be to God, he says, it, it, it gathered together in my name, <coughs> uh, it shall be done for them. Is that what it said? Where if two or three are gathered together in my name, he said, no, there, I'm at, there am I in the midst of them. He said, I'm with you. I'm with you. And when, you, when you're doing my work, Jesus says, I'm with you. When you're going out in my name, I'm with you. And the reason why he's with you, because he's the one that's going to confirm the word with signs and wonders following. Do you want me to prove that to you? Well, I'm glad you want me to. Let's read the rest of this in Mark, the 16th chapter. <laughs> I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to them skeptics. I'm not talking about you. So in verse number 19, when he says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall, they shall, they shall absolutely, positively, unequivocally recover. So then, after the Lord has spoken these words in Mark the, sixth, uh, Mark the 16th chapter, verses 17 and 18, after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. See, this is before he went up to heaven. What he was doing was delegating divine authority to the believer, not the preacher, the believer. And if you're a preacher, you're a believer. All you got is an extra responsibility to preach the gospel that you will be held accountable for. He said, and after he, the Lord had been spoken unto them, he was received up in heaven and set on the right hand of God. Blessed be the name of Jesus where we're seated together with him. That's a whole bit message right there. Verse 20. And they went forth. And they went. What does went imply? When implies that they acted upon what Jesus said. <laughs> Glory be to God. Isn't that wonderful? Ain't I smart? No, I ain't smart. It's in the Bible. I'm just reading the Bible. They went. They acted upon what they believed. They put their belief in motion. Faith without works is, you got it, dead. The Bible says, and they went forth and preached everywhere. Preach what? Preach the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. Remember we preached that? We taught that about three or four weeks ago. About the reason why you need to preach the gospel and not your opinion, not the wisdom of man's words. All these elegant, you know, stories and, you know, and illustrations and stuff, you know. Well, you sound intelligent, you, you're razzling and dazzling the people and stuff, you know, and you're becoming popular because you got these, you know, these, 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 these smart quotes and stuff, you know, that's full of wisdom, but the wisdom of man. No, he said they preach the gospel, the gospel, the gospel is in the Bible. And that's where the power of God is manifested because God only manifests his word. Prove it to you right now. I'm going to prove it to you. Let's read 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere the gospel, the Lord working with them and confirming the titles of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers, and doctor so-and-so with signs following. That what it says? Absolutely not. He didn't say that. No, 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 no. I hope you have, I hope you've been reading your Bible. You've been reading that Bible on your iPhone, your laptop, or your desktop, or your paper or leather Bible. You've been reading your Bible, right? You ain't been watching me. Notice what it says. It says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord, the Lord Jesus working with them. The one that's gathered together with you when you're gathered together in his name. The Lord working with them. The Lord working with them. How? Confirming the word with signs following. I had a mic, I dropped the mic. <laughs> I rest my case. I presented to you the truth that when you preach the gospel, when you act upon the gospel, the signs will follow you. But if you say, well, we don't do that in our church. That's not our custom, which is traditions. And Jesus says the traditions of men 
makes God's word ineffective. Because we never done it that way in our church. We don't believe that in our tenets of faith. Now I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be smart aleck, a wisecracker. And I'm not trying to be critical towards anyone. Please believe that. I'm just showing you why this word is not working in the lives of people. You read it. You may talk about it, but it doesn't work. There's a reason. The Bible says the curse causes does not come. In other words, the curse doesn't come without some type of cause. I was writing that in Facebook when I get these comments and these people and stuff. You know, one guy wrote there and said, he said, if Jesus will to heal everybody, why in the blankly blanks <laughs> he has to heal everybody in the world? I can't repeat what he said. He was upset. He was some kind of upset. <laughs> and I understand it was just the devil in him, you know, blinded his mind, you know, made him see nothing but that. He didn't see the truth. He didn't hear the truth and don't know the truth. So he's going to make a comment like that. But the curse doesn't come without a cause. Now, I know we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. You have been. But if you're not being a doer of the word, then you open up the door for Satan to bring the curse in on your life. That's why Jesus says, if you continue my word, then you're my disciples indeed. Then you are the one who follows after me diligently, faithfully, consistently. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And this Bible is the truth. Your Bible is the truth. The Bible app on your iPhone, your tablet, your laptop. It's the truth. Unless somebody took some stuff out of there, you know, they do it with some of the Bibles. They call them Bibles, but they're not Bibles, really. They're in people's interpretation of what they, th they say the Bible says. Are you listening to me or have you gone home in the corner of your mind? Huh? Let me see. <laughs> Praise God. Isn't this exciting? I'm telling you, it just excites my spirit to know you. There's nothing that I have ever said since I've been teaching on this broadcast tonight that has been full of doubt, unbelief. It has not put limitations on you. But it has been edifying. It has been faith-filled words. Words that bring hope, confident expectation of a bright future for you or your loved one that may be afflicted with disease and sickness in their body. That they can be delivered from this infirmity. They can. God's provided the means. Oh, the Lord God, he loves you. He loves your loved ones. Remind me of that song that I love singing. And that song goes, oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. I got off the tune. My wife can sing, but not me. But he loves you. That's the point I want you to know. Not only did he love you for salvation, he sent his son for salvation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is accompanied with abundant life. Jesus says, I came. He says, the thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that you might have life, eternal life, and life more abundantly. Now, how much more of eternal life can you get? Eternal life means you'll never die. You'll never spend eternity in the lake of fire that burned it forever and ever, and you'll never come out of it if you don't get born again. And that's the only reason why people go to hell is not because of their sins. They sin because of their nature. You know, like a cat acts like a cat because it's a cat, and a dog acts like a dog because it's a dog, and a donkey acts like a donkey because it's a donkey. And I know some of your wives says, well, my husband acts like a donkey, and you know, he's not one. Well, we're not talking about that, okay? But they act like what they act, you know, sinner act like a sinner because he's a sinner. And when he dies and he goes to hell, it's not because of his sins. God would be unjust to do that. It's because he hadn't become born again. So Jesus came that you might have life, eternal life, 
and have it more abundantly that is on the earth while you're living down here because when you get born again you don't die and go to heaven I always I used to think about this I was, Lord you know when we get born again how come you just didn't take us to heaven why you leave us down here in all this mess because you are the body of Christ and you are the light of the world and the only way the people in the darkness are going to see the light is through your life of you hearing believing and acting on the word your labors together with God and the ability and the power to do it is on the inside of you because greater is he that is in you than he that's in this world. I don't know what I said, but it sure felt good. And I was talking to God anyway, not you. So we see here, this is one way that people can receive healing is through Mark the 16th chapter your loved ones, whoever. I laid my hands on my wife and she was healed, praise God. Just simply laying hands on her. Amen? All right, listen, my time is out. But I want to talk to those of you that have been watching this program who have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you the opportunity that was afforded us once in our lifetime. I remember hearing about Jesus Christ going to Sunday school as a young boy. And I remember going to Sunday school, vacation Bible summer school, summer vacation Bible summer school. And I was at a Baptist church and they told me about Jesus and how he loved me. And I remember forget coming out of that church after that Bible study was over, walking down the street on 71st between Maine and San Pedro in Los Angeles, California. And as me and my brother Michael were walking down the road, there was this little boy coming toward us. And I was so excited. And I stopped him in the, in the, on the sidewalk and I said, do you know that Jesus love you? <laughs> I was just, and God let me know that, that was you know, a sign of the call of God in my life. But the point is, is that I, 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 I didn't get born again then, but later on, because I had this knowledge of Jesus, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I got born again. When it came time to turn to him in the critical point of my life, I turned to him and I cried out and I got born again. This same Jesus who caused me to become born again is the same Jesus that wants you to become born again. He wants to give you like he did me a new lease, lease on life. He, went, he gave me a new beginning. You can have a new beginning. That's why the Bible said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish into eternal damnation, will not perish, but have everlasting life. You'll be changed in the twinkle of an eye. All you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ, believe that he is the Son of God, that he came to the earth, was crucified on the cross, died, was buried in the earth for three days and three nights before he went down to the center of the earth and suffered torment in a place called Shoal, a place of Shoal, a place of torment to pay for Adam and Eve's transgression. On the third day, when justice had been paid, God raised him from the dead. He did it for you and I. He was your substitute. Now you have to believe that he did this for you, accept what he did this for, did for you, and confess to God that you believe it in your heart and you confess with your mouth to him and you will be born again. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You're going to say this to God and he looks at your heart. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Do you believe that he came to the earth and was crucified on the cross? Do you believe that he died and was buried in the earth for three days and three nights? Do you believe that he was raised from the dead on the third day? And I want you to tell God what you believe and you'll become born again. Bow your head and close your eyes and say these words with me. Say, Dear God, I come to you now just as I am, a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he came to the earth, was born of the flesh, and was crucified on the cross for sin that he died and was buried in the earth for three days and three nights and I believe that on the third day you raised him from the dead so I could be saved I accept what Jesus Christ did for me I accept him now as my Lord and my Savior and because I believe this in my heart and I've confessed with my mouth I am now saved. I am born again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving me. Amen.
Amen. Praise God. The reason why we're clapping our hands excitedly because the Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one sinner who has repented. In other words, they're having a party for you in heaven, and we just crashed the party. Praise God. Amen. Listen, I have a book in my hand called The New Birth. I want to get it to your hand free of charge and let, so that you'll know what happened to you and you have this book. It's called The New Birth. All you have to do is call the telephone number that's on the screen there on Facebook on the comment, or if you see it on the video in the near future, that telephone number is going to be 810-407-8584. Call. Let us know you got born again and ask for this book, and we'll send it to you in the mail post hastily, as well as some other information about R.M. Hamer Ministries. Listen, I have a couple other books here. I have a book right here, and uh, this one here is called Walking as a New Creation. I haven't talked about this in a while, the book that I wrote. Talks about some of the experience I had about when I got born again, clean Texas, and some other things. And uh, it's called Walking as a New Creation. Uh, you need this book. It costs you $10. The only thing we charge you for. And anybody else that's watching this program, maybe you haven't come to a place in spiritual maturity. You don't know about what it means to walk as a new creation. That means when you got born again. Get this book. It's going to only cost uh, $10 for you. Amen? And uh, with the price now, $10 is not too much. Ask for this book also through the website or through the telephone, and we'll send this book to you in the mail, okay? Well, listen, I want to remind you, the book of John, the 15th chapter, verse number 7 says, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time, this time, 